14th Amendment provides for birthright citizenship. I've looked at the legal arguments against it, and I will tell you, as a Supreme Court litigator, those arguments are not very good. As much as someone may dislike the policy of birthright citizenship, it's in the U.S. Constitution. And I don't like it when federal judges set aside the Constitution because their policy preferences are different. And so my view, I think it's a mistake for conservatives to be focusing on trying to fight what the Constitution says on birthright citizenship. I think we are far better off focusing on securing the border because birthright citizenship wouldn't be an issue if we didn't have people coming in illegally. I the way to prevent that is to secure the border now so that people are, are not coming in contrary. We began by asking about granting automatic citizenship to the children of undocumented workers. I think birthright citizenship as a policy matter doesn't make sense. We have right now upwards of 12 million people living here illegally. It doesn't make any sense that our law automatically grants citizenship to their children because what it does is it incentivizes additional illegal immigration. No, you're really busy. We're going to get right to it. It's great to be with you. Uh, thank you. One of the hottest topics and uh, one of the most uh, pressing issues facing our country is immigration and yeah. particularly yeah. birthright citizenship. Yeah. And there's yeah. been a lot of discussion, even from you. Tell us where you are on birthright citizenship now. Well, I think we need to end birthright citizenship. As, as a policy matter, it doesn't make any sense that we should be incentivizing illegal immigration. That there's no reason that federal law should state that if someone is here illegally, that their children are automatically U.S. citizens. And, and I'll note, you know, I'm glad people are talking about this now. Yes. Uh, obviously, one of the impacts of Donald Trump being in this race is it forces the media to talk about kind of whatever he talks about. Right. Uh, and so he recently came out against birthright citizenship. I, I've had that position for many years, back in 2011 when I was running for the U.S. Senate. We recall that, uh, yes. I said very explicitly. The 14th Amendment provides for birthright citizenship. I've looked at the legal arguments against it, and I will tell you, as a Supreme Court litigator, those arguments are not very good. And I'll note, you know, I'm glad people are talking about this now. Yes. Uh, obviously, one of the impacts of Donald Trump being in this race is it forces the media to talk about kind of whatever he talks about. Right. As much as someone may dislike the policy of birthright citizenship, it's in the U.S. Constitution. And I don't like it when federal judges set aside the Constitution because their policy preferences are different. One of the impacts different. of Donald Trump being in this race is it forces the media to talk about kind of whatever he talks about. Right. Uh, and so he recently came out against birthright citizenship. I, I've had that position for many years, back in 2011 when I was running for the U.S. Senate. Well, we recall that, yes. Uh, I said very explicitly then we should end birthright citizenship, and I think that's still the right position. And so my uh, view... I think it's a mistake for conservatives to be focusing on trying to fight what the Constitution says on birthright citizenship. I think we are far better off. We should expand legal immigration, reduce the barriers, reduce the waiting periods, and I've introduced two amendments to significantly expand legal immigration, to double the caps on legal immigration from 675,000 to 1.3 million and to increase temporary high-skilled workers by 500 percent, to double the caps on legal immigration from 675,000 to 1.3 million, and to increase temporary high-skilled workers by 500 percent. I will immediately suspend the H-1B program for 180 days to conduct an intensive investigation and audit into each of the companies receiving these visas to disqualify any company that has abused it and to prosecute any company that has violated it. Big back and forth moments between you and Senator Marco Rubio was on immigration. Uh, many people said you scored some points against yep. Marco Rubio there. Uh, you also said, though, and it has been checked today uh, at the debate, that you denied that you've ever supported legal status for undocumented immigrants. You said, quote, I've never supported legalization. I do not intend to support it. But back in 2013, you did support an amendment. And back when you were making the case, this is what you said. I don't I don't want immigration reform to fail. I want immigration reform to pass. I don't want immigration reform to fail. I want immigration reform to pass. 
And so I would urge people of good faith on both sides of the aisle, if the objective is to pass common sense immigration reform that secures the borders, that improves legal immigration, and that allows those who are here illegally to come in out of the shadows, and that allows those who are here illegally to come in out of the shadows, then we should look for areas of bipartisan agreement and compromise to come together. Now that amendment would have allowed undocumented immigrants to uh, remain in the U.S. permanently and obtain legal status. So how do you square that circle? Actually, Brett, it, it wouldn't have. What was happening there is, is that was the battle over the Gang of Eight, the Rubio-Schumer amnesty bill, which was a massive amnesty bill proposed by Senator Rubio, by Chuck Schumer and Barack Obama. And, and I was leading the fight against amnesty. I was standing shoulder to shoulder with Jeff Sessions. I was standing shoulder to shoulder with Steve King, leading the fight to secure the borders. And what I did, that particular amendment, was an amendment I introduced to remove citizenship, to say those who are here illegally shall be permanently in eligible for citizenship. Now, the fact that I introduced an amendment to remove part of the Gang of Eight bill doesn't mean I support the rest of the Gang of Eight bill. The Gang of Eight bill was a mess. It was a terrible bill. Well, wait a second, and, and what Senator. the Rubio campaign I mean, is trying to claim is, well, gosh... That is not what you said at the time. And Yahoo <laughs> dug up these quotes from back then. You said, if this amendment were to pass, the chances of this bill passing into law would increase dramatically. A few weeks later, during a debate on the Senate floor, Cruz repeated his belief that his am this amendment is the compromise ca that can pass. And you repeated later in Princeton uh, that if my amendment were adopted, this bill would pass. It sounded like you wanted the bill to pass. Uh, of course I wanted the bill to pass. Uh, of course I wanted the bill to pass. Uh, of course I wanted the bill to pass. What my, my amendment to pass. What my amendment did is take citizenship off the table. But it doesn't mean what it, what it doesn't mean that I supported the other aspects of the bill, which was a terrible bill. And, and Brett, you've been around Washington long enough. You know how to defeat bad legislation. Which is what that amendment did. Is it revealed the hypocrisy? of Chuck Schumer and the Senate Democrats and the establishment Republicans who were supporting them because they all voted against it. And, and listen, I'll give you the simplest proof why this notion that my fighting amnesty somehow made me a supporter of amnesty. Jeff Sessions voted with me on my amendment to eliminate citizenship. Now, is anyone remotely suggesting that Jeff Sessions supports amnesty? Of course of not. Course not. Now, we were fighting now, side by the side problem, to defeat though, Senator, Marco Rubio's amnesty, and we succeeded. We defeated it. The problem, though, is that at the time, you were telling people like Byron York with the Washington Examiner that this was not a poison pill. Examiner, that this was not a poison pill. Examiner, that this was not a poison pill. You told him my objective was not to kill immigration reform, was not to kill immigration reform, was not to kill immigration reform. You said you wanted it to pass. You said you wanted it to pass. You said you wanted it to pass at the time. So my question to you is, looking back at what you said then and what you're saying now, which one should people believe? It ends the federal government's bulk collection of phone metadata. It ends the federal government's bulk collection of phone metadata. It is long past time to end this program, and the USA Freedom Act does. It is long past time to end this program, and the USA Freedom Act does. In particular, what it did is the prior program only covered a relatively narrow slice of phone calls. When you had a terrorist, you could only search a relatively narrow slice of numbers, primarily landlines. The USA Freedom Act expands that, so now we have cell phones, now we have internet phones, now we have the phones the terrorists are likely to use, is that the old program covered 20 to 30 percent of phone numbers to search for terrorists. The new program covers nearly 100 percent. That gives us greater ability to stop acts of terrorism, and, and he knows that, that that's the case. What Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton are proposing is that we bring to this country tens of thousands of Syrian Muslim refugees. I have to say, particularly in light of what happened in Paris, that's nothing short of lunacy. That's nothing short of lunacy. That's nothing short of lunacy. What would have happened if your father was trying to get from Cuba to the United States and the political leaders here said, nope, we don't think so, because who knows, maybe you could be uh, somebody who could you know, commit crimes against America. Uh, the refugee crisis in, in Syria is a humanitarian disaster. And, and, and I want to thank 
the chairman for convening this hearing and for helping shine the light on, on, on what is happening. Um, I'm the son of a refugee from Cuba who fled oppression. And to the refugees who've come here today, let me say welcome. And I think the United States should always be a clarion voice for freedom. We have welcomed refugees, the, 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 the tiled, tired, huddled masses for centuries. That's been the history of the United States. We should continue to do so. And the last thing we ought to be doing is sending our sons and daughters into harm's way yeah. to get in the middle of, of this sectarian civil war. And the last thing we ought to be doing is sending our sons and daughters into harm's way yeah. to get in the middle of, of this sectarian civil war. We should be focused on defending the United States of America. That's right. why young men and women sign up to join the military, not to, to as, as you note, uh, you know, ser serve as al-Qaeda's air force. Not to, to as, as you note, uh, you know, ser serve as al-Qaeda's air force. You have said you would, quote, carpet bomb ISIS into oblivion, testing whether, quote, sand can glow in the dark. Does that mean leveling the ISIS capital of Raqqa in Syria, where there are hundreds of thousands of civilians? What it means is using overwhelming air, air power to utterly and completely destroy ISIS. To put I don't believe the answer is sending boots on the ground to Syria. I think President Obama and I think far too many Republicans are eager to get us in the middle of an internecine civil war. You also said you will not put ground troops in Syria to fight ISIS. Well, actually, that's not what I said. Why not? Uh, what I said is we need to do whatever is necessary to defeat ISIS. And that's what I've said from the very beginning. I don't believe the answer is sending boots on the ground to Syria. I strongly oppose the TSA's policy of groping innocent civilians. I have spoken out on this for many, many months. In the Texas legislature, there was a strong bill to ban TSA groping. And it is simply false that the TPP trade agreement gives up our sovereignty. There, there is nothing in TPA or TPP that can give a foreign body the ability to make binding law in the United States of America under, the, under our Constitution. We talked about it a minute ago. The reason is because the Department of Justice has said the only way to implement what they want, universal background checks, is a registry, a federal gun li a federal yeah. list of every gun owner in America, and that would be wrong, it'd be unconstitutional. Oh. And that would be wrong, it'd be unconstitutional. Oh. And that would be wrong, it'd be unconstitutional. Oh. Look, are there things we could do? Sure. One of the things we could do is we could improve the quality of the federal database. Right now, a lot of states, a lot of local jurisdictions are not reporting criminal convictions, not reporting mental health barriers to ownership. And so the, the federal database is not nearly as good as it should be. That, that would be a common sense improvement. I'm Ellen Ratner, and this is Bias Bash. Today, I'm going to be taking a look at Mr. Cruz, Senator Cruz, and some of what he said, and why isn't the media going after it? We know that about a year ago, he opposed gun control. He said that there was a constitutional right to protect children, family, your home, and lives, and to serve as the ultimate check against government tyranny. Uh, but the more recently, he said, everyone has a constitutional right to protest and speak our minds. However, there's no constitutional rights to use force or violence with others. Well, those two statements are a little bit opposed to each other. And where has been the media on this to hold Senator Cruz accountable to his change? But in any campaign, responsibility starts at the top. Any candidate is responsible for the culture of the campaign. The liberal media and Ted Cruz and rent boy Marco Rubio are all blaming Donald Trump for the vicious thugs that shut down his Chicago rally Friday night. Uh, of course, the 
George Soros funded foot soldiers. George Soros funded foot soldiers. Literally, $33 million he paid just in one year. $33 million he paid just in one year to fund groups to spur social unrest. MoveOn.org admitting that they helped coordinate the um, First Amendment violating uh, thugs that descended upon the rally. The secret side of me, I never let you see. I keep it cage, but I can't control it. So stay away from me, the beast is ugly. I feel the rage and I just can't hold it. It's scratching on the wall, in the closet, in the halls. It comes away and I can't. Even though the Black Lives Matter, a uh, black KKK, black supremacist terrorist organization, even Megyn Kelly is hinting uh, that Donald Trump may bear some responsibility. Even though Chicago is a liberal wasteland just 10 days into 2016, 100 people were shot in that city. Criminals like this thug who can be seen posting a video on his Twitter account that's been up for four hours now. Uh, celebrating, he says, shutting down the Trump rally, shooting a Mac-10 submachine gun or a semi-automatic uh, gun. Look at this. What's going on? Okay. So Jay-Z bailing out protesters for the Black Lives Matter movement. George Soros literally giving over $30 million to them. Twitter censoring the top search results for the hashtag Trump rally to make it seem like it was Trump's fault. Oh, an MSNBC article that says that it's Donald Trump's fault and it links to an article from Rachel Madcow explaining that Donald Trump incited these people and all of the pictures have been removed showing the police officers that have uh, had bottles or bricks bashed over their heads and bleeding now just showing uh, um, you know, a bunch of thugs celebrating uh, again when Chicago is a gang infested wasteland filled with thugs like this I know what's going on yeah Black Lives Matter hashtag he put on that Twitter post, right? Celebrating, shutting down Trump rally. Even the Los Angeles Times now appears to blame Trump, saying that he didn't even consult with the police. So it's it's Donald Trump's fault for canceling the rally when the police allegedly didn't say that he should, even though his advisors all consulted with the police, and they're like, hey, bro, uh, things could get really, really ugly here, and you should probably cancel the event. And so he did. And I don't like it when federal judges set aside the Constitution because their policy preferences. And to my open, since when, if you state an opinion, are you responsible for someone else's reaction? Since when, if you verbally lean right, are you responsible for the left's physical reaction? Since when do you have the right to interrupt my First Amendment right to listen to a candidate for the highest office in the land? This is America, not the Soviet Union. This is America. You cannot prevent me from speaking or listening. You cannot censor speech. Free speech is guaranteed. It's why our founding fathers made it their very First Amendment to the law of the land. It's what distinguishes us from communist countries and totalitarian regimes. It's why people risk their lives to come here. Your free speech, however, is not more important than mine. Your free speech, if it differs from mine, doesn't mean that you're right and I'm wrong and therefore I must be silenced. But that is exactly what the left tried to do in Chicago last night and again moments ago in Kansas City to more than 25,000 who came to hear Donald Trump. Some supporters, some undecided, some simply curious. Others, abject anarchists, yelling, Bernie, Bernie, and responding to activist calls at hashtag shut it down. Now, MoveOn.org organized and reportedly paid protesters to disrupt the Trump event. One protester, Sanders supporter Tony Fitzpatrick, says he went to 
dissent to ask those in attendance to please reconsider. Really, Tony? Let's get this straight. Tens of thousands of people waiting in line for hours, stretching city blocks, and you take it upon yourself to have a discourse on the benefits of a leftist, socialist, almost communist candidate? And pray tell us, Tony, who were you going to pick to have this discourse with? Now, you have the right to protest. Of course you do. If you want to dissent, dissent. Consider a blog, a tweet. Hell, put a sign on your front lawn. How about you just vote for someone else? But in a civilized society, you do not have the right to interrupt or censor political speech. Let us listen and make our own decisions. But then again, Tony, it's Chicago. Where kids playing in the park are so used to gunfire, they don't even react. And where as many as 57 people can be shot in one weekend. I know. I live there. And you want to blame the dust-up on Donald Trump. Even when protesters come for the specific purpose of creating chaos... So someone sucker punches someone else and then rightfully arrested. That's supposed to be Trump's fault? A criminal law primer, folks. Words do not justify violence. You cannot defend assault by arguing verbal provocation. Otherwise, every man who battered a woman would say he was justified because she mouthed off. And any time you get 25 to 30,000 people anywhere, unless it's to hear the Pope, there are going to be disagreements, especially in a highly charged election year like this one. And by the way, ever been to a baseball game, a heavy metal concert? People disagree. And little Marco, in his desperate attempt to criticize Trump, says... These words have real consequences. Uh, Mr. Uh, you know, Donald Trump has a big platform right now. He's the front runner in the Republican Party. Everybody's paying attention to what he's saying. And these words have consequences when you're president, even more so. Words have consequences? Well, maybe under Sharia law where you can be murdered if you say something considered offensive, but not in the United States of America and not under our Constitution. And by the way, Marco, didn't you say your parents came from Cuba? to avoid a repressive regime? Stop being so small, Marco. Americans have been angry for a long time. Barack Obama, the great hope and change unifier, has openly pitted the haves against the have-nots, the cops against the very public they defend. We've never been more divided. Religions being forced to act against their own religious principles. Republicans characterized as wanting dirty air and dirty water. Conservatives are blocked from speaking at universities. The left so dictatorial that they will stop at nothing to prevent free speech, even in the cradle of education. Black Lives Matter. Occupy Wall Street determined to disrupt our free discourse so that they can control the narrative. Look, any course correction after seven years of hazardous charting will be difficult and upending. The status quo, like the establishment, are petrified of Donald Trump to the point that they are willing to take action the likes of which we have never seen in American politics. The desperation of these anarchists is nothing more than an effort to suppress the protected rights upon which our republic was founded. This is America. You cannot stop us and you cannot silence us. Beware the sleeping giant, the silent majority of us. We will not be silenced. In session, averted is in. No appeal on the docket today, just my own sin. The walls cold and pale, the cage made of steel. Thank you so much.
I'll talk first about natural born citizen. Before July the 4th, 1776, everybody born here was born a subject of the King of England. So our first presidents, George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, John Quincy Adams, Andrew Jackson, and William Henry Harrison, who were all born before July the 4th, 1776, were all born as subjects of the King of England. These presidents, along with other free Americans, were transformed formed into citizens on July the 4th, 1776, by means of our Declaration of Independence. So our first presidents were naturalized citizens, and the Declaration of Independence is the act which naturalized them. Now let's look at our Constitution. It was ratified June the 21st, 1788. Article 2, Section 1, Clause 5 says, and I'll read just the first phrase, no person except a natural born citizen or a citizen of the United States at the time of the adoption of this Constitution shall be eligible to the office of president. So our first presidents were eligible because they were citizens at the time the Constitution was ratified. The framers knew what a natural born citizen was, and they knew they weren't natural born citizens. So they had to exempt them, their generation, from the requirement of being a natural born citizen. But after that first generation of presidents was gone, all subsequent presidents were required to be natural born citizens. So what is a natural born citizen? In order to understand the genuine, the genuine meaning of a text, we must use the definition the framers use. Otherwise, texts become like Play-Doh. They mean whatever you want them to mean to get the outcome you want. And Congress could change the definition of terms in the Constitution from time to time by passing a law. Well, that's ridiculous. When our Constitution was drafted and ratified, everybody knew what a natural born citizen was. Vattel defined it in his book, Law of Nations. And we know from correspondence from Benjamin Franklin and other sources that the delegates to the convention of 1787 where this was drafted relied on Vattel's book. It was a classic studied in the universities and everybody knew it. Vattel said that, a nat that natural born citizens are those born of parents who are citizens. It is necessary that they be born of a father who is a citizen. He goes on to say that the place of birth is not significant because it is our extraction who our parents were which gives us our rights as natural born citizens. I printed out what Vettel said. It's two pages. Contact me and I'll send you the link to this. Our framers were very concerned about foreign influence. They did not want foreigners with shared loyalty to be president. They wanted only natural born citizens to be president, people who inherited their citizenship from American parents. 
Another document from the time of our framing is David Ramsey's 1789 dissertation on citizenship. Ramsey was an historian, a founding father, and a member of the Continental Congress. His dissertation on the manner of acquiring the character and privileges of a citizen of the United States was published in 1789. At the bottom of page six, Ramsey says, quote, the citizenship of no man could be previous to the Declaration of Independence and as a natural right belongs to none but those who have been born of citizens since the 4th of July, 1776. So Ramsey sets forth the understanding of the time that a natural born citizen is one who is born of citizens. So a natural born citizen inherits his citizenship from his parents. Just as he inherits his eye color, he inherits his citizenship. No provision in the Constitution makes him a citizen and no act of Congress makes him a citizen. Just as no provision in the, con in the Constitution or Act of Congress determines his eye color, it's inherited from his parents, it's in his blood, not an Act of Congress. Now let's look at Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. There is a difference between a natural-born citizen who inherits his citizenship from his parents by the laws of nature alone, like eye color, and someone who becomes a citizen by operation of a man-made proclamation or law such as the Declaration of Independence, a clause in the Constitution, or an Act of Congress. One of the purposes of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment was to extend citizenship to freed slaves. That first generation of freed slaves became citizens by operation of a man-made law, the 14th Amendment. So they became citizens, but they weren't natural-born citizens because they weren't born of parents who were citizens. However, after that first generation of former slaves became citizens, their children were natural-born citizens. So the 14th Amendment has nothing to do with natural-born citizens. The 14th Amendment has to do with the creation of new citizens. Under some people's misreadings of the 14th Amendment, anyone born here is eligible to be president, including babies born to Islamic terrorists. Our framers didn't want that. They wanted only people who were born of parents who were already American citizens to be eligible to be president. And supposedly, we would have standards for determining who qualified to be a citizen. And now a few words about Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz. Marco Rubio was born in the United States of parents who were Cuban nationals. They were lawful residents of the United they were lawful residents who were subject to the jurisdiction of the United States, but they weren't US citizens when Marco was born. So Marco is not a natural born citizen. Marco is a naturalized citizen because his citizenship is by operation of a man-made law. Section 1 of the 14th Amendment 
If it weren't for Section 1 of the 14th Amendment or some other man-made act of Congress, Marco would have been born a resident alien. He would have been born with the same status of his parents. Ted Cruz was born in Canada of a father who was a Cuban national or a Canadian citizen and an American-born mother whose status at the time Ted was born is not clear. But her status doesn't matter. The father is the one who counts. Now at the time of the framing of our Constitution, the doctrine of coverture was in effect. Under that common law doctrine, husband and wife are one, and the man is the one. The woman's legal identity was subsumed into that of her husband's. As a holdover from this, married women still, still sometimes refer to themselves as Mrs. John Smith. Furthermore, so Ted is not a natural born citizen. Furthermore, Ted held Canadian citizenship most of his life. He didn't even renounce his Canadian citizenship until less than two years ago. I have not seen the original document, obviously, but this certificate is presented on the internet and is presented there as genuine. This certificate acknowledges that Ted formally renounced his Canadian citizenship and stopped being a Canadian citizen on May the 14th, 2014. Contact me and I'll get you copies of these three documents. Just who is Ted Cruz? Oh please, you should all be aware that Ted Cruz's wife Heidi is a vice president for Goldman Sachs. Would they be more disturbed to know about her work on the independent task force that wrote Building a North American Community, which was sponsored by the Council on Foreign Relations? Well, that is certainly a revelation in itself. Well, perhaps you just open up a can of worms. Now, before you get your tea bags in a bunch about this Ted Cruz pylon, let's take a step back and understand what Preps is saying. And if you love America as much as you say, then you'll listen very closely. So Ted Cruz stands up and says it's time to step up and restore the American promise. But what promise is he speaking of? The promise his wife broke when she sold America out to the Council on Foreign Relations. The promise that she broke when she began work on building a North American community. What the heck is that, you ask? Well, yes, it does sound so innocent. We're just building a community for North America. Surely you can't be against building a community, right? Well, yes, Mrs. Ted Cruz, I am. So how do you dissolve a nation's sovereignty? peacefully and with the people's consent? Well, you can just ask Mrs. Cruz or anyone living in Europe for that matter. They all now use one currency. You see, the transformation of Europe into a single national body with its own bank, legislative body, and military force took many, many years to accomplish, about 42 to be exact. It began with the Treaty of Paris in 1951, and that created the European coal and steel community and then when the 1957 Treaty of Rome was signed, it morphed into the European Economic Community. In 1993, by order of the Maastricht Treaty, it was renamed the European Community and then absorbed by the newly formed European Union. So why is this important to Americans? Why should you care? 
Well, one only needs to work the clock backwards from Heidi Cruz's work to build a North American community to see what the globalists have in store for this hemisphere. What follows is only a portion of the exhaustive timeline that's posted at globalresearch.ca. Now, I'm the first to acknowledge that there's a good deal left unfinished on the conservative agenda. Our cleanup crew will need more than two years to deal with the mess left by others for over half a century. Now, it all began with Ronald Reagan, Republican, in 1979. He was campaigning, and while he was campaigning, he proposed the North American Agreement to produce, quote, a North American continent in which the goods and people of the three countries will cross boundaries more freely. He fulfilled that campaign promise in 1981 when he presented the idea of a North American common market. Then, four years later, in 1985, he notified Congress of his desire to begin negotiations with Canada on a free trade agreement to promote trade. He gives then Congress 90 days to approve it. Two years later, in October of 1987, the Canada-United States Free Trade Agreement is finalized. U.S. Trade Representative Clayton Uter said of the agreement, quote, we've signed a stunning new trade pact with Canada. The Canadians don't understand what they've signed. In 20 years, they will be sucked into the U.S. economy. With Reagan sealing up Canada in 1990, the new president, George H.W. Bush, would begin work on Mexico. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind, peace and security, freedom and the rule of law. And just two years later, in December of 1992, Bush, Mexican President Carlos Salinas, and Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney officially signed the North Atlantic Free Trade Agreement, otherwise known as NAFTA. Calling it a defining moment, President Clinton, with great fanfare, signed legislation putting the North American Free Trade Agreement into law. Then in 1993, President Bill Clinton, he signs on to NAFTA, and then executes the agreement, creating the North American Development Bank and the Border Environment Cooperation Commission. Another year later, Miami, the Summit of the Americas, 1994. The U.S., Canada, and Mexico invite Chile and 33 more nations to join, expanding the pact to be called the Free Trade Area of the Americas, or the FTAA. Barriers to trade and investment are eliminated. Flash forward six years, the year 2000. While Americans are celebrating their independence, this July 4th would mark a new date in world history. The date Mexican President Vincente Fox proposes his 20 to 30 year timeline for the creation of a common North American market. Meanwhile, Ted Cruz is working for the Bush-Cheney presidential campaign as their domestic policy advisor. Cruz eventually assists Bush, Bush in winning the now infamous Florida recount, then accepting a position in the Bush administration Justice Department and Federal Trade Commission. Then the following year, 2001, Dr. Robert Passer publishes his book, Towards a North American Community. In it, he openly calls for the creation of a North American Union. And in doing so, he earns the name, the founding father of the NAU. April 2001, President George W. Bush continues where his father and previous presidents left off and signs the Declaration of Quebec City, renewing the commitment to hemispheric integration. Five months later, the new Pearl Harbor would plunge the United States into a global war on terror. Three years after 9-11, in November of 2004, the Independent Task Force on the Future of North America is formed. Their focus? no longer trade and prosperity but security the sponsoring parties are not politicians acting in an official capacity but instead three private groups headed by the council on foreign relations and their respective organizations in canada and mexico they claim in their own words north america is vulnerable on several fronts 
The region faces terrorist and criminal security threats, increased economic competition from abroad, and uneven economic development at home. The CFR taps the wife of Ted Cruz to become a member of the task force. Heidi Cruz accepts. Now, March of 2005 would be a big year for advancing the agenda of the North American Union. And with the CFR laying the groundwork, Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. would sign the Security and Prosperity Partnership, or SPP. Susan, I want to switch gears, talk about this other issue that's out there, the creation of a new North American Union, if you will, similar to the EU, the European Union. Uh, the president was asked about this today at the summit meeting with the leaders of Mexico and Canada. Uh, listen to what he said. I'm amused by the difference between what actually takes place in the meetings and what some were trying to you know, say takes place. It's, a, it's quite comical, actually, when you realize the difference between reality and what some people are talking on TV about. All right, well, what is, the, what is the background? What's going on here? Oh, Wolf, there's a lot of talk in the blogosphere and uh, conspiracy theorists who believe that this uh, summit was really a secret plot, if you will, to establish a super government in support of big business, that even there would be some sort of super highway that would be traveling through all three of the countries. That same month, the Texas Department of Transportation signs the agreement to build the Texas NAFTA superhighway parallel to Interstate 35. And Heidi Cruz's task force publishes their report, Building a North American Community. Three months later, in June of 2005, Lou Dobbs goes on CNN and blasts Dr. Robert Pastor's congressional testimony on the CFR report to expand the borders and eviscerate U.S. sovereignty by incorporating Canada and Mexico. America begins to take notice. The Bush administration's open borders policy and its uh, decision to ignore the enforcement of this country's immigration laws is part of a broader agenda. President Bush signed a formal agreement that will end the United States as we know it, and he took the step without approval from either the U.S. Congress or the people of the United States. Bill Tucker reports. The Security and Prosperity Partnership of North America sounds benign, hardly like a policy that critics call NAFTA on steroids. It's a deal that few have even heard of. It's being done again by very few people at the very top on behalf of the investment class, but the working class of people, uh, political officials across our country from communities, uh, from cities and so forth, they don't know anything about this. Yet it was agreed to by Mexico's President Fox, Canada's Prime Minister Martin, and President Bush in 2005. Administration officials counter their critics by saying everything about SPP is on the White House website. And they say the partnership is not a treaty, but more of an outline of priorities between the United States, Mexico, and Canada. Still, some wonder why there haven't been public discussions about the goals being pursued. This SPP includes, for instance, a committee that is sitting down to harmonize our meat inspection and food safety. So how far away from a trade agreement can your dining room table and what you feed your kids be? Other parts of the agreement mention border security as an issue, which include all of North America. In fact, the name of the agreement is not security and prosperity of the United States, but of North America. The Dobbs clip was heralded as a massive public revelation. And then what would appear to be a coordinated effort, Patrick Wood of the August Review, Congressman Ron Paul and Patrick Buchanan all come out against the proposed merger of the three nations, sparking a national outcry from the grassroots. The liberty movement in America goes into overdrive. Texans push back against the NAFTA superhighway. So what does this mean? Look, it took 42 years to create the European Union. If we continue on this timeline using the European Union template beginning with Reagan's initiation of the North American community in 1981, we should see full dissolution of U.S. sovereignty by around 2023, meeting the deadline Vicente Fox announced on July 4th of the year 2000. My friends, they say nothing in politics is a coincidence. That date was picked to send a message. 
So here we are, the onset of the 2016 election, seven years from the Fox deadline. Ted Cruz is the first player in the game. So just who is he really? Should we believe his liberty rhetoric? Remember, he is the man who won Bush the Florida recount and then landed a job in the Bush administration. His own wife is a Wall Street insider and one of the architects of the destruction of U.S. sovereignty through her membership in the Council on Foreign Relations. These few points alone make Ted the perfect candidate for selection. And if he is selected to be president in 2016 and then re-elected in 2020, that would make Heidi Cruz the first lady of the North American Union by 2023.